deliberately chose a bit of a mystery topic. And I'm going to challenge myself to see if I can work my teeth around it. So, this indenture. We've been seeing, actually ever since the Iran Affair office, we've been seeing the president get up at the podium or on TV, constantly advocating for job upgrading, job retraining. Our workforce is really lagging behind in state-of-the-art today's skills. Uh, I personally have had a bit of experience with that because I worked for a while for a community organization, which was a recipient of the original grant. And they took those funds and they actually paid for unemployed people to get retrained and to upgrade their skills. It's a very contemporary thing. But it makes me stop and think. Let's roll back the clock a little. Let's go back. Let's go back before the Renaissance. Let's go back before the printing press. When was the printing press? 1465? Something like that. And we think about the <coughs> great structures that are put up in the 13 or 1400s. <coughs> wonderful Gothic cathedrals, which are to this very day are just astounding. And you think some of them took over 100 years to grow up, as a matter of fact. But one stops and thinks. Now, here there weren't any written texts. There's no handy dandy how to books. Because everything was still a written manuscript and primarily for the priesthood. So your average everyday worker didn't have any books. There were no architects. There were no handy dandy building inspectors. But how in the world did these people have the skills to put up these incredible buildings? And it falls back on the apprenticeship system. Back then, all through the Middle Ages, as a matter of fact, the master mason was the chief architect slash contractor. And he took underneath his wing young lads who would be trained. And it's through the great oral tradition that the skill sets of the trades were passed on through mm -hmm. generations. This actually goes back to the Roman times, if you're really into research. Mm -hmm. Skills were passed through the trades from generation to generation, whether it was a, a wheel maker, a barrel maker, Stone mason, carpenter, furniture maker, it didn't matter what the trade was, there was the apprenticeship system that carried on the great skills. With the coming of the printing press and the early Renaissance, all that changed. Because finally, some of these skills and techniques could be put to print and distributed widely. So one of the outcomes of that is that the mason, who was the big banana, the big chief, usually a Freemason on ranch jobs, that's mm -hmm. another interesting story, um, started to lose some of his status and prestige because trace people were getting input, were getting written instruction on how to go about it. Now that carried through in the colonies, um, well into the 1800s. Because when the colonies were first developed, they received all their written material, especially dealing with the trades, architecture, and design from England. And they're brought over from wealthy East Coast merchants who went to London twice a year for business, and they were in that social class when they became exposed to the most recent things that were being published in Britain. One of the interesting things that came about as a result of King George was that classical architecture became politically correct. And as 
as a result, that one of the things that developed in the early 1700s was called the Grand Tour. When young English lads, when they finished their classical education, not being lacking their funds, went on a grand tour of Europe, they went to Paris and went to Germany, but they especially went to Italy and they went to Greece. And they brought back designs, sketches, and drawings of the antiquities. And they also plundered the ruins and brought back all kinds of things, which are still, some of which are still in English museums. So when they came back, they published these books. Merchants from the Eastern Seaboard, from Boston and Philadelphia, on their grand trips to England, brought these books back. Now these books were for the gentleman architect. This is a person who had some background in the trades, was well read, well educated. Um, he got these books through his trader friends, but they weren't generally mass distributed. So as a result, the apprenticeship system was still very strong until the middle of the 1700s. And when I say the apprenticeship system, I'm going to fall back on, I wish I could find it, couldn't find it. I remember coming across a handwritten one page document at the very top in beautiful foreign, horrible handwriting that they had back then with not a spot of ink or misspelled words, just beautiful. At the very top it said, This indenture. And it was a written contract between the master. And the apprentice, the young lad. And it spelled out very specifically all the do's and don'ts that are going to happen over the next five years. Very specific. And usually, a young lad would travel to get himself an apprenticeship. So he would end up staying with his host. And in that adventure was how many meals, how many hours a day, Seven days a week, you're going to sleep with the chickens in the back. I'm not going to gallivant with my daughter. You know, I mean, it was very specific. It was a legal binding contract, something you could take to the lawyer. And these these apprenticeships were so highly sought, it was equivalent today to finishing high school and going on to college. It was the thing to do. It was a socially encouraged, acceptable. As a matter of fact, when you got your apprenticeship, and you finished your apprenticeship before you got married. So, you had a priority straight. <laughs> but what happened was a gradual evolution. The first American who published a regular everyday builder's book, Master Benjamin, 1820. He was the first one to actually print and distribute handy dandy how to's with a gentleman builder. Now, in there, you'll find a good portion of the classical buildings in New England the churches, post offices, some of the standard building forms. With the coming of the 1800s, the middle 1800s, there finally was a public push to establish an educational system. They then established high school, and slowly they began to open up the trade schools. So a person could indeed go to a high school trade school. But the first business education in the late 1800s, actually 1890. There it is. Carpentry, joinery, stair building, estimating, specification writing, and drawing. Business education. It was put out by the International Textbook Company, and although it was found its place in many public libraries and in many schools. It's 
main focus was reaching out to the rural person who was isolated, did not have access to a trade school, to a formal education. Very sophisticated. It teaches you how to lay out circular stairs. It teaches you how to do what's very common in Victorian uh, architecture, which is a little bit later than this book, but how to draw a conical roof. I mean, all the things that, if you were to go up to a job site now and grab a carpenter and say, build me a set of circular stairs, they mean, huh? <laughs> There's no way. But those are the formal skills and training that you received back then. So, this is 1890. Unfortunately, this company didn't last long. 1920, they didn't belly up. But it had over 20 titles, including one which I would love to be able to find. Actually, I don't have it right here. Um, the Woman's Institute of Domestic Arts and Sciences. That one's <laughs> <laughs> going, no, no, no. <laughs> I would love to get that one. <laughs> I could have a field day with that. So, after the Second World War, the apprenticeship system still existed, but it had changed. And it became more of a formalized agreement through an institution, through a high school, or through a trade school. Here again, there was a bit of a formal agreement where you would hook up with a master tradesperson, go out on the job, get your training, take some tests, you might have to take an exam at the very end. But we've gradually lost that. I will say after about 1970, 1980, it's a hard thing to find. To a great degree, it's being offered here, although not in the, as an apprenticeship type system, as a trade school. So when I think about what the president has to say about how we really need to get our current workforce retrained, I think back to the great history of how trade skills have been passed down through the ages. And we've got a history going back thousands of years. And my own experience, you know, in dealing with people, actually I was in a position where I actually had to assign people up for various classes. So I called them up at home. Hi, I'm calling from so-and-so. We understand your interest in taking a so-and-so class. And the kind of response that I got, I made over 100 calls, and some of the 100 people for a variety of different classes. But it struck me, about one out of every eight or nine, by the time you finish the interview, you'd say to yourself, oh, that's a good one. You know, but the rest of them are like, yeah. what was that again? I don't know. You have to call them up two days before the class starts. The babysitter. Oh, yeah. They can write it down. They can make a note for themselves. I mean, are they going to forget their doctor's appointments and their dentist appointments? I mean, where are they? Not in those days. You're out the door. So, I'm just wondering how we can incorporate the traditional education system that this has been talking about into today's world. Because it seems that just laying out free education somehow isn't enough. All I gotta do is show up. It's all paid for. Form, draw it, no tickets to chase around or you know. What do we have to do? Do we have to bring back a system like that? Where it's a formal agreement? where you work for peanuts for five or seven years and learn the trade and become a master yourself? Or should we just throw money at the problem and hope it's all going to be okay? Who's the thought? 